Different cultures have grappled with the fundamental question of balancing individual freedom with collective needs. While the specific terms of the social contract may vary widely from one nation to another, the underlying principle of exchanging liberties, exchanging freedom for security and order, remains constant throughout history. Let us compare today China and the United States in terms of freedom, democracy, and representation in their government. Hello everybody, my name is Fernando Munoz and welcome to my channel. I just want to let you know that I make this exact same content in Spanish. So if you have somebody in your circle who doesn't speak English, make sure to link them to that um, link in the title of the video. I appreciate it very much. Let's continue. So think for a moment of a newborn infant who is entirely reliant on its parents for sustenance, for warmth, and for protection. He is nothing without them. As this child continues to grow, that dependency shifts but persists. They now rely on teachers for education or healthcare providers for well-being and eventually for employers for income. To function within any society, individuals often compromise personal freedoms. Obeying traffic laws, for example, or paying taxes and adhering to other social norms are examples of liberties that are yielded in exchange for the security of an infrastructure or the collective benefits that are provided by a government body. This interplay between individual needs and societal structures forms the bedrock of what we understand as a social contract. In China, for example, the Han Dynasty, which went from 200 BC until 2000, 220 AD made very strong government with its own rules. People at the time had to follow these rules and be loyal to the leader. Now, in return, the government provided them with protection. They built roads and buildings and made life a lot easier and calmer. This way of doing things lasted for a very long time in China and helped China become stable and rich. Later, rulers like those of the Sui dynasty implemented something called the civil service examination system, which was a standardized method for selecting government officials based on their merit, their ability to, to provide for the people, rather than only on family background, which was what was happening before. Later on, the Tang and Song dynasties made this system even better. In places like Europe and America, the idea of people agreeing to rules is more talked about. In the 17th century, the moral and political philosopher Thomas Hobbes proposed that without rules, people would always be at war. People would always be fighting. So at a point, people agreed to let strong leaders make decisions in exchange for safety. This is how powerful kings ruled for a very long time in Europe. But later, people like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau started to ponder about different angles. They thought people should perhaps agree together to make a government that helps everyone. This is what the American and uh, French revolutions were all about at the time. People wanting a government that listens to them. One could say that China's governance today is a mix of both, but I'm tripping over my skis here. so. Let's get back a little bit. The word republic is just a synonym for the term representative democracy. The people govern. The people are sovereign, of course. But it is a dictatorship of the people, as the constitution of China so states. They do so through delegation of authority to agents that represent them so as to make the process more reliable, safer and more accountable. Let's compare the U.S. Republic, which operates on a multi-party system with regular competitive elections, a separation of powers and a robust protection for individual liberties. Its democracy is founded on the principle of popular sovereignty, where citizens directly elect representatives. However, consider that democracy is the worst form of governance. Anything less than a democracy and is not a government anymore it's just pure despotism and anarchy. Democracy, when it is defined as universal suffrage, is the most rudimentary and flawed form of governance. We don't have to look too far than the current U.S. presidential election to demonstrate that universal suffrage 
as the ultimate singular expression of democracy as Americans like portray it, gives such flood results that, until not too long ago, the choices to lead the number one power in the world were a criminal and a mentally deteriorated old man. The Sino old man, well, allegedly still in charge, has now been replaced in the race by a woman whose competence, or lack thereof, is dumbfounding. I am sure you have all seen this four-minute video of her repeating this in different settings. In what can be unburdened by what has been. I can imagine what can be and be unburdened by what has been. What can be unburdened by what has been. I am not going to torture you with that. My intention is not to mock America's choices, but simply to remind you that, like freedom, pure, unbridled democracy produces tyranny of the majority. As the old saying goes, democracy is like two wolves and a sheep voting on what we're going to have for dinner. Every four years, Democrats and Republicans put up a show for you, the sheep. In contrast, China's political system is characterized by meritocracy and limited political pluralism. Oh, limited political pluralism, now you say. Do remember that there are eight political parties in China, but it's more like a rowing team. Parties and representatives must add to the strength of the nation by supporting the direction the country has chosen. There is no energy or time wasted on pointless opposition. The government's legitimacy is rooted in its practice of consulting with the public. This is what shapes the nation's direction. Contrary to the misconception of China's democracy as merely endorsing leaders' directions, it actually involves genuine dialogue and input from citizens. <laughs> the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, they convene during the two sessions and the third plenum which just took place to actively gather public opinions to various channels. These platforms aim to involve citizens and incorporate their views and ideas into discussions and in policy making. When it comes to elections, a candidate's success is evaluated by their ability to implement policies that are going to fulfill citizens' priorities and aspirations. There are no sheep in China's democratic system. You deliver or the people will not vote for you. Hear it from the people themselves here. So that is the differences on democracy. So let us get back a little bit to the idea of freedom and oppression, both in China and the United States, which is basically the subject of today's video. Finding the right balance between personal freedom and rules for everyone is a difficult task in either country. Even in places where everyone can vote, universal suffrage, unfairness will still happen. Voting actually means that some people win and others lose, which can make people feel left out. Now, when forced into a democratic system, equality and inclusion programs can exacerbate the flaws of the representation through universal suffrage. True representation arises from listening to the people and acting on their wishes while maintaining societal harmony, plain and simple. You fail to do that, and that constitutes oppression. It constitutes hindering on individuals from reaching their full potential. Oppression occurs when the rights and the freedom of a substantial portion of the population are systematically restricted. Unlike individual injustices, which may not necessarily prompt immediate action, a critical mass of these affected individuals is necessary in order to mobilize these bureaucratic governments to address the issues. You do not combat oppression by forcing representation. You combat oppression by implementing mechanisms that ensure citizens' well-being and societal harmony at local levels. 
That is what China does. I can't get her smile out of my head. Such positivity, such looking at the brighter side of things in the face of so much trouble and so much uh, difficulty. Local leaders are incentivized to address grievances and disputes swiftly and effectively to ensure they will be re-elected or promoted. Universal suffrage and DEI initiatives do not inherently prioritize listening or supporting victims of injustice. DEI is just a tool for temporary appeasement rather than a fundamental solution to oppression, and unresolved underlying issues may eventually, in time, lead to a revolution. You gotta love that Second Amendment, no? So going back to the comparison of China and the U.S., the intensity of the struggle for freedom often correlates with the degree of oppression. Those living with relative liberty tend to be satisfied with the existing social order. Think China which often provides opportunities for personal growth and prosperity. Again, think China. Conversely, individuals subjected to oppression are driven to fight for fundamental human rights. Their resistance is a clear indictment of the injustices that they have to endure on a daily basis. This begs the question then, where do we witness a greater demand for freedom, a greater demand for equality and justice? In China? or in the West. Typically, only those experiencing oppression have a compelling reason to publicly express their suffering. Individuals who are satisfied with their societal roles and the benefits that they get generally do not require special movements. They often simply address their concerns locally through elected representatives in their area. It is crucial to understand that Freedom is not an absolute but a relative concept. What one person perceives as freedom might be seen as oppression by another, and this affects how people see China. The lines between liberty and restriction are fluid. They're influenced by cultural, economic, and political factors. A genuinely free society ensures that all individuals can maximize their potential without facing prejudice, discrimination, or systemic obstacles. Is that taking place in America? Most Chinese people will tell you that they feel free to live their lives as they see fit. So why do you think the West is afraid of China's rise? Why are they dead set on stopping China from reaching its full potential as a civilization? Isn't that an indicator of how free China really is? All right, friends, thank you so much for watching this video. See you tomorrow when I will talk about CIPS, the China Interbank Payment System. If you're interested in this kind of topics, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell button to be notified whenever there is a new video out. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.